Hi everyone, uh, my name is Latik Morali. I am an MSc in Ecological Economics and I am interviewing Pete Smith. Uh, Pete is an expert conservationist at uh, Wildwood Charity Trust uh, in Kent. Um, he is the director of the campaign uh, for land value taxes. Uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to meet with me today, Pete. Could, me, could you tell me more a bit about yourself? Okay, Doc. I, I um, am an ecologist. Um, originally, um, I studied biochemistry, then went on to study ecology, population modeling, I got involved in uh, nature conservation and saving rare species. And I've worked for a number of charities where I became senior. I started um, uh, my own charity specifically for the purposes of rewilding. Um, I'm, I suppose, known for um, organizing the first beaver reintroduction in the UK and uh, reintroducing many animals such as dormice and red squirrels and pine martens and a lot of work about habitat restoration the purchase raising money for the purchase and the restoration of um, rare habitats and rewilding projects both within the uk and globally so um, I've, lately i've been working as a consultant on some global uh, rewilding projects on a very large scale and so that's that's my background um, and but all through my career I've actually been very interested in land economics what are the fundamental reasons we choose to use land and what are the forces um, that play when we use land both efficiently and inefficiently and that's how i've become very active in understanding economics and in the um, campaign to promote land value taxes thank you pete um so um i suppose you are very familiar with the uh, work of henry george progress and poverty that's a very popular book among progressives um, who advocate for land value taxes. Uh, next, um, uh, I'd like to ask you, um, what is a land value tax um, beyond the textbook definition of a tax uh, on, um, on land? What, what is the definition? Okie doke. So we're, we're getting into both theory and and practice. So in my view, we have the textbook definition, ad valorem taxes on the rental value or the unimproved rental value of land. And what we're really talking about by those gobbledygook words is a yearly tax. Just as if you rented that land as if there was no buildings on it, right? It's just the, the land itself, no improvements, just the land. And that essentially, it can be considered its location value or its monopoly value. I think it's easier to use the words monopoly value because that comes into the next um, of the definitions we should think of and what is our land value taxes. Essentially, they're monopoly taxes. Wherever monopolies exist, you can either solve it by taking those monopolies and putting rules and regulations on it, or you can tax it. And that's what Henry George and many other economists, Henry George wasn't the first. In fact, every great economist throughout history has recognized that the taxation of monopoly not, it doesn't distort things, doesn't rob people of jobs. So you're looking at monopolies, and monopolies are all around us. It's not just the unimproved land value, the location value of land as a monopoly. You've got all kinds of monopolies, intellectual property rights. You've got government-granted monopolies, where people get a monopoly through um, law and rules and regulations. You've got platform monopolies, such as Amazon. 
you know, everybody just wants one place to go to to easily be able to get uh, a product and only so many people can set up a delivery system that will satisfy. These are platform monopolies. You know, you've got a, a monopoly of, say, healthcare in an area. It's not efficient to have two MRI machines, you know, um, to test people. You can't compete. It's not a, a monopolies are in delivery of water and electricity. You can't. And efforts to try and create a market have been abysmal. They've failed. So there's hundreds of monopolies all over. So the identification of monopoly and it's either it's taxation or it's control are really what we're talking about. And then there's the third stage, which is the broader issue. It's not just about land. It's not just about monopoly. It's also about externality. Where have you caused harm? Have you polluted a river? Now you can have laws, and these are good. You need laws to stop the pollution of rivers, but also you should pay for the damage you do. So when we pollute, when we harm others in our work, we should have to either be prevented from doing that or we should pay a fee relative to that harm. And that suppresses the harm we do. So we've got an automatic system for reducing harm and increasing good. And that's the whole point of those that series of definitions of a land value tax. First, textbook definition, all the work that classical economists did on that. We've got an expanded definition of um, monopoly, you know, monopolies in the banking and finance industry, the monopoly of creating money. Banks get to create money. That's a monopoly. It's a government granted monopoly. They shouldn't get that for free. And But you might not want to tax that. You might want to stop people producing money for free. You know, nobody should be able to just invent money. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of monopolies. And we've got the big one is the externalities of life, how we hurt the planet, our children, our futures. All of those, as the great Henry George and others have worked out, can be we can make humanity better and more efficient by taxing those things. Thank you very much, Pete, um, for that very broad um, um, uh, explanation of land value taxes with its um, multiple uh, multiple definitions. Uh, so um, next, uh, I'd like to know uh, what is marginal land? Okay, you... marginal land is a is a kind of concept now. This all um, kicked off by um, the great David Ricardo and Ricardo's Law of Rent, which is very much related to everything we're going to talk about in, in the questions you've posed, is at which point is land not worth using? Okay? So in margin means the margin between use and not use. Okay? And in most contexts, it's the point where a farmer says, can I be bothered to farm that land? Or a hunting estate will say, is it worth us, you know, allowing people to go hunting there? Can we get? So there's different land uses, but all of those land uses have margins. So there's not one fixed margin. There's thousands of margins. You've got margins. Is it worth building a motorway? to this place is it worth having a school at this place is it worth farming is it worth um having a hunting estate is it worth um putting work into having a nature reserve there so each one of those points are margins where we choose whether we should do something with this land should it be privately invested in or government wants some kind of use because we're looking at what's the reward for the effort through all the different land uses so we've got marginal land which is is it worth farming is it not worth farming but we've got all the other land margins of how we use land sorry to complicate it but that's the definitive answer Okay, um, 
Next, I'm just going to ask a uh, spontaneous question related to margin, marginal land. Uh, what's the uh, relationship between um, government subsidies and marginal land? Well, any form of subsidy shifts the margin. So lots of things affect margins, right? What's the tax burdens? What's the inheritance rules? But if you give a subsidy, say we are going to subsidize land, um, by giving farmers a subsidy, all it means is they are going to push out and use more land to farm. But here, but it gets very complicated in that you will choose to use land, but not invest in machinery or labor to farm that land. So you end up using land more inefficiently. Okay, so you have to think as the as a real deep economist thought is any form of subsidy will use you if you go and subsidize butter people will buy more butter that's the simple thing right if you pay people to eat butter they will eat more butter how much you pay how much butter they consume right simple as that so we can think of that with land but as an economist, you're going to think of all the other issues. What's the inputs, the pesticides, the labor, the capital investment? All these things come into land use decisions. Um, so, yeah. And this is, for me as a conservationist, this is the real cracker. We have environmental subsidies, right? Agri-environment schemes where we give farmers money to farm a little less intensively. Now, once you learn land economics, you realize how stupid this is, right, for nature conservation. On the surface, it sounds wonderful. Let's give the farmers money and they're going to be a few more bees and a few more butterflies. But what we don't realize is more land's going to be farmed, which destroys nature far more than farming a land in a wildlife friendly way. We might as well just leave it alone. And that's where nature conservation organizations, because they like all these subsidies, pays wages, keeps, you know, offices going. They like all these subsidies, but really it actually still damages nature. All subsidies. Obviously, agri-environment schemes damage nature less and just Headage payments as they, that are being reintroduced to the UK, absolute insanity, and other forms of, of subsidy. Also, you've got price support subsidies where you you price, you support the sale, or even where you you put tariffs on goods coming in. They are all effectively subsidizing land. And by the very definition, it means more nature will be destroyed. That's very uh, um, unfortunate. Um, yeah, hope, hopefully, um, you know, go governments can uh, act on that environmentally favorably. Uh, so, um, do you have anything to bear on how your um, how your insight into ecosystem services and biodiversity um, ways that a land value tax can um, can uh, work to, work to their benefit. How they can be applied um, across the globe. You said you did some global work, right? So there are different um, uh, political um, political administrations. There are different types of geographies um, throughout the world, like. Um, and the the climatic uh, conditions differ substantially um, between uh, you know the like for instance of the global north and the global south. Um, mm -hmm. This one perspective. So how how do you uh, think um, you know it can be applied uh, say to the developing world or to the developed world? Do you know just another other, another country? Well, you we need to think of this. Logically, the economic forces uh, work the same in Papua New Guinea or in Los Angeles, right? So each country has different rules and regulations. We can see around the world where you have the public collection of monopoly, economic rent, or the state ownership that generally nature and people have better lives. 
So if we if we drill down and look at some examples, right? Botswana, they they luckily never had the English law on land ownership. They still retain the law of uh, leasing land and tribal rights and different land has got different um, leasing requirements you have to pay for it or it's owned by a group of um, tribal elders who make decisions it's owned in common it's like the old commons and all this means you effectively get more wildlife and better off people with better education standards better welfare standards, better health standards. You can go down all the metrics and look. It, it, the countries that capture land value in some way, Singapore, Japan, um, Hong Kong, they can all have even developed societies, doesn't matter where they are on the development spectrum, they will generally have happier, healthier people and more nature. You know, sounds mad, but it really does work that. You know, Hong Kong has got some great nature areas, even though it's got some pretty grim living conditions because everybody's dense in. If they didn't have the land value capture system, it would be a lot worse. In Botswana, you have got continent leading levels of education, life expectancy, infant mortality, purely down to the rules of using land. You've also got fantastic wildlife um, I know the area really well, used to work in Namibia, and you can really see the difference where you have some form of state control. Because the minute you have privatized land wealth, where the private individual captures all the economic rent, that creates the, the incentive to exploit land on all natural resources. It doesn't have to be just land. It can be water. It can be natural resources so you will start exploiting that and creating greater externalities and you will create poverty the minute you have land owners and people who have to pay to occupy land you start having a real problem you, you increase poverty drastically basically and then you get the problem that people can't earn enough money and there's no jobs and you tax people's work so they get even poorer and you have even more poverty. Now, how you administer a tax, depending on the land or the natural resources you want to limit its use and get government revenue from, can work in many ways. Um, you could see that in history, um, in the British system and in other countries, there were fees charged for the use of certain natural resources. Um, one of them being firewood. So you didn't want everybody to chop down all the forests. So how you could stop everyone chopping down all the forests and to use that natural resource sustainably is to charge a fee. Now, you could say that everybody's got the right to have a certain quantity, right, to meet their absolute barest needs. But if you want something more, if you want to exploit for economic gain, you have to pay a fee. This is a perfect system for all forms of natural resource use, whether it's coal or copper extraction or cobalt. And you can combine the fee-based system with its externality uh, component as well. So having just a permit system, there's a wonderful example of I was studying not so long ago of fish, um, fishing rights, especially around the Falkland Islands off the coast of Argentina, where you have to pay a charge and they assess the population with squid that is famous for this certain highly valuable squid. The, the, the scientists measure the population of the squid and they will charge a fee and limit the amount of licenses. So you can either up and down the amount that you're you're allowing people to take and you charge them a fee and these work in tandem often when you just have permit systems these do not work as well as having a fee based system um the the the, the financial component um uh, helps the mind so different administrations but the core of it is putting a monetary value or limiting the use 
of land and natural resources. So it is equitable. It is everybody shares the same sort of rights. And if you charge a fee, those that use it more have to pay more. And that money is now offsetting other forms of tax on people's work and trade. And that is where you get the poverty alleviation and even more equity that everybody shares in the fruits of nature. Great. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, so uh, on, uh, on a, a related uh, uh, question, for the ecosystem services and biodiversity uh, bodies of water provide, should, should those, should those um, bodies of water be subject to a land value tax? Uh, they're not necessarily subject to developers, but they can uh, build, uh, for instance, um, you know, in the in the ocean, not very not very far from the shore, there can be oil rigs, for example, and mm -hmm. those will be very damaging to ecosystems, and you know, uh, you know, actually, first and foremost, very damaging to biodiversity. Um, yes. So, so similarly, should um, should such uh, bodies of water not not just not just you know places near the shore. Um, actually, it's probably not likely that there'll be an oil rig near the shore. It'll probably be like <laughs> far out. Um, but then there are negative um, externalities from that activity that would stifle ecosystem services um, that others could, you know, benefit from as well as biodiversity. So it could also occur in, you know, bodies of water closer to the mainland, mm. like, like lakes and lakes and rivers so so should those bodies of water be subject to a land value tax because um if we go back to henry george's philosophy um henry uh, he said that it's not just land that is uh, that a pub that is a public good it's everything you know yes. that all so, the gifts of mother nature as he would have yes, described it. um so yeah could you um uh, okay you... so you don't want a land value tax based on you can't assess a rental value of water you can uh, assess the rental value of the use of water okay so and there's many uses for rivers and lakes and, and whatever. So originally, is there a monopoly value? So most of the monopoly value of, of inland waterways and even coastal is in the properties that are situated by the sea. So a land value tax will, will take that monopoly value anyway and use it for public goods. But other uses, monopoly uses, is there a certain type of ferry crossing? that you use are you fishing is the fishing got a limited uh, resource if you're a salmon fisher in scotland you can charge up to five thousand pounds a night for the best fishing spots now that landowner or the fishing rights owner did not create that wealth it's salmon salmonids trout they will rest in certain areas and it's all to do with how the the gravelly uh, floor of the river uh, forms that creates the ideal fishing spot where the salmon will actually bite on the fisherman's hook the landowner didn't create that so that value can be astronomical because people want to you know cast a rod rich people and catch that fish so there is a monopoly value in that area so all fish licenses should be subjected to a tax you're taking a natural resource the same with the fish in the sea fishing licenses should be issued and the tax should be the monopoly value but also the externality we always have to analyze with what is the monopoly what is the externality if we are robbing mother nature and that fish stock is in peril you know, the blue fiend tuna is going to go extinct. We now have to slap not only the monopoly value, but the externality value tax upon anybody fishing that system. There's many benefits of doing that. You will actually make the system self-policing because those people who pay the tax will police those who try to not pay the tax and do it. You know, you get a self-policing system. Many benefits of doing it. And you protect fish stocks. But 
Also, pollution. When you pollute rivers, we've got a huge problem in Britain as around the world. There's so much farming effluent going into rivers. There's so much sewage. Farming effluent the biggest problem. Sewage is the next problem. Everybody should have to pay for that pollution going into the river. That will then make water companies and farms treat their sewage and effluent far better, therefore minimizing their tax burden. You get all these positive outcomes from taxing the bads of rivers. Some places, navigation is a problem on rivers. There are a few places where there's too many ships. Then you have to say access to that has to be charged. So you can see this in better examples, airports, where airport landing slots are actually worth a lot of money. And they are allocated, of course, by the government. They're not allocated by the person who, who gets this right. So that should be done, can be done at auction, can be done in a number of ways of assessing that monopoly value. And such is river water use. A, a great chap I once met, he was high up in the, um, he was a, a British representative, diplomatic representative to the um, United Nations. He told me of his efforts to try to get revenue for UN projects such as for human rights and to protect children and to make sure people get um, enough food to be funded through international copyright levies and fishing and natural resource uh, exploitation in non-national waters. And he was told that the American government basically said they would um, get everybody sacked if they did this. They don't want, they didn't want to have the UN funded without the control of the nation states for obvious reasons. But it would be a fantastic way to fund the United Nations. It would not cause um, people to lose jobs. It would have benefits for the world and huge benefits for the world. So there's... These are the ways we can look at water bodies, I suppose. And But the analysis has always got to be, what are the monopolistic aspects of those use? And what are the exter externalistic um, problems that you can reduce through taxation? Thank you, Pete. So just to clarify, uh, when you have used the term monopolistic, uh, do you uh, do you mean uh, property rights and what is excludable? Any form of monopoly, which you can use as a mathematical system, where you see that that value is derived from some form of limited ability to use that product, where competition doesn't come along. OK, so it's not a free market. You know, monopoly affects all free market systems and Therefore, our, our system is the, the central core of what I try to promote is to take as much monopoly in a mathematical way out of private hands and put it into either public hands for good or return it to every single human being equally. And then also to look at what can be done with externalities, damage, and all that has to be done in the most efficient, non-complicated way possible that's easy to administer and prevents fraud. And that that understanding, that system of what is a monopoly, what is an externality, how do you achieve it efficiently, it, I think, is the solution to all the world's problems. It will transform humanity into a wonderful, happy place, and it will protect the world for many generations to come. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I guess um, now I'm going to ask: um, Could you uh, could you recommend any uh, land valuation methods? And are there some valuation methods uh, that are uh, that are more favorable to conservation uh, than others? Um, I'm not an expert in this area myself, but I do know some experts who are land surveyors and tax experts and there are many models you can use there are already many commercial models that assess land value these are used in the insurance business 
where they separate the value of rebuilding a home from the um, from the land value itself when making a claim of your house burns down. And these are very efficient. There's also other forms of um, um, models you can use to assess value. And I don't have a particular one. The reality is it doesn't matter whether you get 110% or 90% or 100% of the land value, as long as the majority of it is taxed. And you need a system that's simple, equitable, and is subject to interrogation, but not abuse. Uh, if you know the land market as I do, you know there's thousands of people working on schemes to reduce various property taxes, business rates, or whatnot. Now, business rate is not a land value tax because it's on the assessed on the value of the property, not just the land. Um, so, and these will do all kinds of ways to reduce that tax. So there's always an incentive to, to fiddle the system. And many places where you have had land value tax, such as in Taiwan, they, the systems have been subverted, even in Japan. They, they, over time, those systems of land value taxation were subverted. So you need a, a simple system that cannot be subverted. And there's lots of mathematical models. Now in the days of geographic information systems, all land can be essentially mapped. You can take an area value of what the land is, what's its highest permitted use. So the other theoretical issue we haven't talked about is you should tax land at its highest theoretical use, that which the government have granted permission, whether it's to build an office block, a factory, um, or a house on that so it's that creates the maximum efficiency because you're getting people to use land as efficiently as possible so that the the, the models are there and some people there's a the wonderful chap at the um uh, organization called alta um and that's the liberal democrats land value tax system he's got a wonderful computer model with the whole one of my heroes um a guy called hector wilkes wrote a wonderful scientific paper about land value tax. And it just so happens he also founded, he was one of the original trustees of Kent Wildlife Trust. He died before I went and worked for Kent Wildlife Trust. And his paper, where he assessed the land value tax in one of the towns in Kent and showed how so simply it could be done and then how it can be adjusted um, as, as needs must as inflation and land values change. But it's, there's so many good academic papers and there's such a big profession. You, you know, it's not for you and I to get involved with this. It has to be professionals who understand this well. Thank you, Pete. Um, so I'm going to conclude this interview uh, by asking, can you tell me how uh, land value taxes can stimulate uh, job creation? It's, it's land value taxes just by their mere presence. So as Henry George famously said, you could take, collect all the land value taxes, collect all the money and dump it in the sea. And you'd still benefit because what you're doing is suppressing the price of housing and land and monopolies, which make it easier for people to access those areas. Okay. And by doing that, you've got to think of old David Ricardo's law of rent, by suppressing those prices, you suck people from working in peripheral areas, marginal areas, um, you, you suck them into using the best productive land possible. So you stop the waste of using unproductive land. Okay, so you'll save more nature. But we're not going to dump that money in the sea. We're going to use that money for public services, for building schools and hospitals and policing and security and looking after people. And you don't have to tax people's work. So we've now got three benefits. You've got the fact that you can use the money to pay for things, government services. You can... You're not taxing people's labor and their trade. 
So therefore, that um, suppression, the deadweight costs, as some economists call it, so taxes on labor and trade are deadweight costs that stop people getting employment, that creates unemployment and creates poverty. You take that away, so there's going to be a lot more jobs, productive jobs, and there's going to be a lot more trade, productive trade. You're going to have more money for good public services. Therefore, you're going to have efficient public services so people are healthier, happier. They can get to work faster and better, better public transport, better systems of housing. That reduces your costs. It means you can export your goods and services at a much cheaper price and compete on the world market. There's so many benefits of having land value taxes and external taxes just as much. But you basically create a super economy. And those countries that have delved into taxing land in one way or another are the most competitive countries in the world. Singapore, um, not so much Japan now, but Japan in the history, um, um, Hong Kong, um, stuff like that. Those people who can capture land values. And look what happens when land values go out of control. We're now seeing the death of San Francisco, one of the most productive places in the world, the place where the greatest mines created the greatest um, electronics and new industries. Their house prices have gone up that much that people couldn't afford to live. It literally destroyed the city. And now they're suffering horrendous consequences because they're not capturing land values and they've allowed monopoly privilege. And this is all in a great circle, of course, because when Henry George discovered his thoughts on land value tax, he was on his way to San Francisco to start a new job as a printer. And he described the history in his great book about how San Francisco started off with wealth and jobs for all when land values were low. And as people took land into private ownership and as they became more productive, it created poverty because of the disparity of who owned land and who did not. And we've now taken his observations to their most horrendous, farcical conclusion with what's going on in San Francisco today. Why um, Why do you say it's a farcical conclusion? Because you've got probably the most productive place in the world for new industries, you know, whether at Cupertino or around that area. And um, all that productivity has just been captured by land values. I mean, the great investor Peter Thiel said it uh, great. He was an investor in new industries and said, all my investments just going to pay rent on the land of the offices and the homes of the people who are coming to work here. There's no money for productive investment. It's the whole thing's farcical. It's you've basically taken the greatest minds and you've trapped them in the amber of horrendous land values, which is destroying America's competitiveness and all the ingenuity of the best minds of all the people around the world who come to live and work there. Yeah, um, yeah, so hopefully we see some resolution for that, yes. um, you know, within the next uh, half century. And, yeah. and look at all the homeless. California introduced a law to stop the increase in property taxes, not a true land value taxes. And this is what's caused all those 10 cities to sprout up. You know, whole productive communities that used to have lots of work and happiness are now mired in horrendous poverty, vast uh, tent cities, homelessness, poverty, drug use, crime, and it could all be solved by land value tax. Thank you, Pete. Um, it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, uh, best of luck. I uh, wish you the best in your um, endeavors uh, as a conservationist and with uh, Wildwood Trust and uh, promoting uh, land value taxes um, in, um, in your efforts. Thank you. And thank you for being interested in what I think is the most important subject anyone can think of. And these days of 
you know, look at the wars that go on in the world, international problems. People are really warring over natural resources. You know, Russia, Ukraine, America, China, they're all just bullying each other to try and get control of natural resources for the future. If that profit of natural resources was removed by every country having a land value tax, there'd be no reason to argue and go to war, would there? Yes. Now the wisdom of Henry George should permeate all our minds. Yeah, and thank you for that. And thank you. You take care. All yep. the best with your research. Yep, thank you. Bye-bye.